so as we get started here, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, J.S. Cornier, uh, a co-founder and general partner of Real Ventures. J.S. is also a co-founder of Montreal-based Element AI uh, and a current board member with the organization. Uh, he's very passionate about working with entrepreneurs to elevate human consciousness using conscious leadership and technology in his practice. Uh, he's a charter member originally from Sorel, Quebec. So JS, thank you so much for contributing to this discussion today. I know you know Drew well, so <laughs> the introduction's already made uh, and you know we're excited to kick this off. So I'll pass it over to you. Thank you both for being a part of this and uh, looking forward to hearing what you both have to say. Thank you, Josh. Thank you everyone for joining us. Good day, I'm not sure if it's morning or afternoon for you. Uh, it's afternoon for me, I'm in Montreal. I think Drew is in Toronto in his house. I recognize the background there. <laughs> um, so Drew, why, why don't uh, I let you start and uh, give us an introduction about yourself and, um, and ACORN. Absolutely. Um, so my uh, background is in tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. Um, I, uh, I actually kind of spent my whole, whole career focused on, on medicine, starting uh, when I was heading off to University of Michigan um, down in the, uh, in the U.S. to do an undergrad in molecular cell developmental biology. I actually also went down there to, uh, to play baseball. Um, but ultimately, we, uh, we ended up having some amazing opportunities to look at strategies in organogenesis and all of these new emerging technologies and, uh, and basic science research and how they were going to eventually affect us down the road. I continued that and did a master's there in, in, in that subject and uh, was all uh, ready to head off to medical school and ended up getting um, offered to, to play professional baseball. Um, so I very quickly applied to PhD programs to make sure I wasn't losing any momentum and started a PhD at University of Toronto in the off seasons uh, in biomedical engineering, where I would say I really um, honed my focus on, on the tissue engineering aspect of it. While I was there, I ended up uh, continuing and working in Mount Sinai Hospital, where we were essentially taking these very successful animal studies that had been done, where it was uh, we were able to outgrow cartilage and bone, thinking about using these technologies to replace arthroplastic surgery, where we actually replace fake knees and fake hips. Um, it was an amazing opportunity to really look at something that was going very well and study and take it into practice. So I was going into the OR, taking biopsies of, of patient samples, cells, and bringing them back to the lab to attempt to outgrow um, these tissues. And it was um, very evident very quickly. I'll save you uh, a, a large number of, of writings and publications, uh, but what we ended up zeroing in on is the age of the cells, as well as their disease state was vastly influencing our ability to outgrow these cells and actually create functional tissues. So it was this huge problem um, that uh, was looming on the horizon that was identified, which is that when we need our cells the most to perform and be inputs for all of these new regenerative medicine and, and cell-based therapeutics, our cells are going to be at their absolute worst. And so we're going to be taking cells at their worst and asking them to perform at their best. And it really became very evident that we need to be thinking ahead of this and making sure that we actually are preserving these cells when they are the most viable and the most useful to us. And so that's really the youngest age possible and definitely before we enter disease states that really compromise their function. And so my, my baseball career ended with an injury. So I, uh, I ended up giving my full focus to, uh, to Mount Sinai in this work. Um, and I have witnessed as I progressed with my career, the uh, trials emerging, actually helping individuals and, and using these in, in human models. And, one of the trials that's going on right now that's in phase one is actually using our own cells to treat the very injury that, uh, that ended my baseball career. So mm. a little, little late for me in, in that regard, but that's an issue of, of you know, function and performance. Um, what we're seeing right now across the world is the ability to 3D print human hearts in Tel Aviv, um, reconstituting re, uh, human bladders and actually implanting them into patients at Wake Forest University um, and, and restore function and, and bladder control and these things. And, uh, and phase one trial right now to treat Parkinson's, macular degeneration, all using our own cells as the inputs for these things. And so ACORN has emerged really as an opportunity for all of us to make sure that we are able to tap into this next generation of treatments that we're thinking ahead and preserving a piece of us at our best, which is today, because unfortunately 
uh, it only gets worse as we age um, and make sure that we have access to those cells for, for all of these treatments as they continue to, uh, to enter mainstream medicine. Thank you for that. Um, so, I mean, we are hearing, like you mentioned, there are a few, uh, a few cases of um, significant work being done on the research side about using these stem cells, but like how far really are we to being able to, to use those things for real? And, and yeah. do you see in the future the ability to rebuild large portions of the body using these stem cells? Yes, I mean, the short answer is absolutely. I think uh, we get this question a lot where people, you know, have heard about stem cells for a long time and, and they're wondering where stem cells can actually benefit them uh, and they, they want that right here and now. And I think that we have to, as patients and, and, and even as, as healthcare providers, exercise um, some patience. Um, and usually when, uh, when I talk about these things, I reference the Wright brothers. You know, they, they discovered flight uh, back in 1903. And it would be almost four decades later before the first commercial flight flew across the Atlantic. Um, so we, we do need to allow these technologies to develop. And the identification that stem cells exist in their function or body, bodies is not actually our ability to leverage them and use them for our health. That is what's all the work that is going on right now. And rather than the discovery of stem cells, I would actually say that, that the real leaps forward that have come to allow us to harness their power have come in two technologies that really have emerged just recently. And the first one is uh, the discovery of, of the ability to create iPSCs, induced pluripotent stem cells. And this is the ability to take an adult cell, uh, as simple as a skin cell, uh, and draw it all the way back into behaving like that embryonic stem cell, that magic moment when sperm eats egg and it become, can become any cell in the human body and does. And so that has circumvented two huge problems. One is having the right cell source that we need to actually create a therapeutic or to replace cells that are damaged. And the second part is having enough of it. These cells can reproduce um, and, and multiply and create whatever volume of cells we want. So now we have in theory, the ability to create a kidney cell from a skin cell and also make that kidney cell into enough cells to be able to form the cells required to, for an entire kidney. The second technology is CRISPR, which uh, many people have, have heard. It's definitely reached mainstream media in a, in a few occasions. And essentially it's just cut and, piece, uh, cut and paste for the human genome. We can actually target segments of the genetic code that are improperly functioning will lead, for lead to disease and code for disease. And we can actually edit those out and replace it with a properly functioning segment of code. So now we can actually take the cells from an individual and make sure that it, it is not inherently encoding for disease downstream. And so these two things have really opened up the possibilities. And in theory, we actually now have the tools required to treat any disease. And it's a powerful statement, but it's absolutely true. And that's the phase mm -hmm. of time we're in right now where doctors and scientists across the world are all applying these tools into their own therapeutics. And we've actually seen it in humans today. So, you know, when do we see this reach mainstream medicine? I think in the years to come, we're going to see more and more therapies come on. And, and when I say years to come, I don't mean 20, 30 years. I mean, in the next 10 years, where you are going to see an absolute wave of these coming online one by one. Already, you know, we've had um, a lot of these things applied to what we call compassionate use or individual case studies. And so that example with the human bladder, we had a, a there was a woman in, in um, North Carolina with spina bifida, could not control bladder function. And there's a lot of of um, excitement over this case because they actually uh, recreated a bladder, you know, in a bioreactor and, and through 3D pin printing uh, mechanisms and implanted that bladder and it was fully functional and actually restored that young woman's ability to control her bladder and increased her, her quality of life immensely. And so, you know, that is a case where we've seen it work. Now, when that actually translates into being widespread is only a matter of time. And that's one example. So then what, would you say that what's holding us back is less technology, but more society and all the, the different processes and frameworks that we need to go through to get an innovation to market? Yeah, I think that there's, that's, that's a huge part of it. Um, yeah. You know, we need to have, um, we need to have play a little bit of catch up with our healthcare system, I think in, in a little bit in, in multiple respects. And, and, you know, it, it is, uh, uh, you know, helping people immensely all over the world, but it's still very much focused on reactionary medicine. 
So thinking about, okay, there's a problem, how do we address it? And I think there absolutely is a place in regenerative medicine to do that. Um, but most of the technologies that we're looking at treating in regenerative medicine, like Parkinson's and macular degeneration, these are progressive chronic diseases that can actually get diagnosed much earlier. So this interventional side of it, and even preventative side of it, is really also kind of having to shift the mind share of, of physicians in our healthcare system to thinking that way and actually starting to roll out therapies that are thinking that far in advance. Um, so there's a couple of factors at play, but absolutely uh, the other element to it is, um, is safety. Like, you, you know, anytime there are new technologies and we're putting components back into a patient, you, you need to make sure that these things are safe and effective. And it is proving out to be, in many instances across the board in tissue engineering, there are immense benefits that our patients are receiving. And then the next step would be actually to make that much more widespread as opposed to these individual moments. Great. Thank you. So uh, tell us, like, how does ACORN prepare us for that? that future? Amazing. I'm, I'm glad you asked, Jess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the next generation of, of therapeutics is going to be cell-based, right? So we're not manufacturing our, um, our chemical compounds, you know, in a factory or a lab. We're actually using our own cells to create these new therapeutics. And so ultimately those therapeutics are only going to be as powerful as the cell that we have at our disposal. And we're thinking of actually leveraging our own cells to con confer health to us in the future to replace everything from, you know, a patch of tissue to an entire organ system. Ultimately, we want to start with the best material at the beginning. If you're making a drug, you want that those materials, those chemicals to be absolutely pure. And we want the same thing when we're starting tissue engineering strategies and making sure that the cells that we have access to are as healthy as possible and have the best chance of giving that patient benefit. So unfortunately, as we age, there are a whole slew of mechanisms that end up increasing the damage uh, to those cells, reducing their functionality and reducing their capacity to actually confer a therapeutic benefit. Mm -hmm. And so we want to get ahead of that as much as possible. And what ACORN allows you to do is essentially buy time. We are, we are some people have compared us to a biologic health insurance policy, um, essentially allowing you to make sure that you're stopping and freezing in time that aging process and that disease progression so that you have the best version of yourself to use as an input for, for all of these therapeutics in the future. Great. Um, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I, and I think that it's also really important to note the things that we've done to actually bring this to be accessible, right? Because this, you know, before when we were thinking about actually harvesting cells, you were drilling into your layout crust and harvesting bone marrow. Um, and it was these very highly invasive procedures because mm -hmm. of those technologies we talked about before where we can actually create um, uh, these uh, stem cells for us to use from adult cells. We can actually take cells from anywhere. That technology was actually developed around taking skin cells. So what ACORN has done is actually innovated around the medias that allow us to ship so the liquid that the cells are submerged in to maintain their viability. So we can actually take hair follicles, plucked hair follicles, non-invasively, and that tip, the root, the bulb of that follicle is 20,000 plus cells that are viable and, and ready to be leveraged in the future. Mm -hmm. And so we take those cells and we actually uh, have optimized the way that they're, they're um, uh, transported um, and then cryogenically stored. So we, we operate a facility that uh, allows us to freeze those cells in time in liquid nitrogen and make sure that they are not aging, not accumulating more damage and, and ready for you in the future. Um, so if I'm, a, if I'm a big smoker and I eat fast food every day, should I quit these bad habits before I store my cells? That's a good question. So there's two things really that you're, you're thinking about. One is your health, right? So we can actually restore health by stopping smoking. We will see the lungs at least partially repair themselves. The liver is very good at doing those things. Um, but ultimately there are systemic effects to, to bad behavior that, um, uh, that do persist. Um, so yeah, I, I think that it is always, my advice is always to make sure that you're trying to live your healthiest life possible. We're also trying to get ahead of aging. And so ultimately the progression of aging, the shortening of our telomeres, the DNA mutations that accumulate over time. You know, there are studies that demonstrate that DNA mutations accumulate in our, in our bodies um, at a pace that doubles every decade. So mm -hmm. uh, that goes by. So ultimately you're also trying to get ahead of aging. So I think that there's a, a balance there where I would suggest 
that at your earliest possible time point, make sure that you're having your cells banked. And if you are successful um, at making this uh, a transition in your life into enhancing health, there's always an opportunity to also bank your cells. Uh, we've made this, um, based on those innovations, very economically approachable. We want to make this accessible. We are Canadian after all. So we believe in accessible healthcare. And so for the price of Netflix, you're able to keep yourself stored with us. Cool. And I, I, I am a customer, so my, my cells are stored, although I stored them uh, more than a year ago, and I, I would rather s store them now. I, th I actually think I'm healthier now than I was back then. Um, but that's a different story. Well, we'll, we'll get that done, JS. So like, Drew, if you are, if you are massively successful, if your company becomes the success that you, you envision, what will, how will the world be different? Yeah. Um, so it, it really is going to push the levels of imagination that, that we can um, think about here. But ultimately, when you actually are, are saving a piece of yourself, right? So your cells, not only is there the ability to leverage those cells in the future, but there's a lot of information in those cells. And so it's actually the combination of that information and the treatments that are being developed that is truly going to empower healthcare to, to completely change and to, to preventative. If we think about looking at, at genetics, and this is the next area of ACORN that uh, we'll be really excited to, to announce in the future of, of how we are expanding our, our um, services around around genetics, but um, more on that to come. Ultimately, using that information, we'll be able to diagnose and discover disease that will come about down the road much earlier, even before the first symptom, and then intervene using those technologies we talked about and the fact that you have your own cells banked before you ever get sick, ultimately preventing disease from ever showing up. So what I believe is going to happen in the future is that if we have access to information and ourselves as an input, we are going to be going and, in, and living in a future where we're going to be eradicating and eliminating diseases one by one. And it's going to be extremely, extremely exciting to witness. Great. So I want to shift gears now and, and talk a little bit about you, the entrepreneur and your entrepreneurial journey. Before I do that, I want to make sure that you share with the group um, how they can have their 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 cells um, saved if, if they wish to do, so, to do so? Absolutely. So um, if you'd like to have your cells saved, you can get more information at acorn.me, but I'm on the uh, 40 hours Slack channel and, and um, my email is there. If you'd like a behind the scenes view of that, um, please just reach out to me directly. I'd love to make that happen for you, but you can do it all online as well. Great. So uh, if any of you have any questions, feel free to, to send them into the chat and I'll, I'll try to uh, incorporate some of them in the, the time that we have left. Uh, so, so Drew, if I'm not mistaken, this is your first company, right? Um, I would say, yeah, this, this is, this is my first company, um, as a founder. And, uh, I'm, 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 I'm assuming that you had an idea of what it would be like before you started. I'm interested in what your perspective is now, looking back at what the journey has been and what are were the major highs and major lows? Yeah, so it's, that's a, that is, uh, it's a long journey, um, even though it's yeah. been, uh, we've only been around for a short amount of time. I think that um, there's, I don't know if anybody else has heard, but there's a global pandemic going on. So that has absolutely influenced uh, our, our, our roadmap. Um, but really it's, it's been an amazing discovery, I think of, of people um, and some of the amazing people that I've had a chance to work with mm -hmm. um, at Acorn and just watching, um, watching them succeed and have a passion for Acorn and bringing this together and, and the, that team atmosphere that we have had. I definitely had a chance to experience that in baseball. You know, everybody aligned together for a common goal. And I would say that uh, my experience as Acorn has taken that to a whole nother level, right? I mean, here we have the opportunity to literally do something for people today that may save their lives in the future. So that is a really exciting thing to be a part of and, and watching um, people be a part of that and get passionate about that has been really exciting. There's absolutely been challenges, right? We are trying to convey a very scientific, um, uh, futuristic topic, really. Not a lot of people have even heard the term regenerative medicine. 
So um, talking to people about that sometimes is a challenge because there's a lot of education that has to go into it. Um, but ultimately we were uh, hitting our stride in those conversations with people um, dealing directly with businesses early on in, uh, in the company's uh, commercial launch. And we were actually going into companies on site. I was doing uh, lunch and learns and, and demonstrations um, and, uh, and talks at companies and sharing this message. And the response was fantastic. We had people signing up. We had companies who were onboarding Acorn as a benefit for their employees or supplementing the cost for their employees. Um, and it was a really exciting avenue. Um, and of course, as soon as we really are hitting our stride in that, um, ultimately it was uh, unfortunate uh, timing, but um, uh, COVID-19 uh, emerged and there was a lot of shutdowns and everybody moved to remote working. And so the model of really how we were accessing um, individuals to get this message in, into the world um, was absolutely dampened. Um, and so some of those groups that we were talking to, just they still have not gone back to, to a, a scenario where it would be possible to engage with them the way we were before. And so we've had to really kind of shift the focus of, of where we are prioritizing reaching customers and clients and patients. And ultimately, uh, right now we're bringing on partners and, and I'm excited to say we'll have nine locations across Ontario where you're able to go and get this done. Um, and that's really emerged out of making sure that we bring this to you. We're launching a program where we'll actually send a technician to your house and you can do this for your family. Um, and so making this as accessible as possible and not asking you as we were before that if you wanna get this done as an individual to come into Toronto General Hospital to our, our clinic there and, and have this done, which ultimately is, is not people's first choice right now about what they, where they would like to be in the middle of a hospital that's treating patients that have COVID. Mm -hmm. So um, we've shifted to bring it to you. And, and it's been really exciting to see people's responses and the receptiveness around that. And uh, we've got a lot of really exciting ways to continue to leverage that in the fall. But it has been an absolute challenge and a shift of focus um, based on uh, a very different uh, go-to-market that, uh, that we had to develop around this. Yeah. What have you learned about yourself on this journey? Yeah, well, Jess, you, you probably know that best <laughs> and I'm happy to share. Um, it, it has been, I think, a journey of, um, of a balance of, of optimism and excitement about a really bright future. And then also the realities and challenges um, that are day to day and being very honest about the challenges and the amount of time that we as a small company have to address those challenges and how we can make sure that we're staying on a path um, and have that same vision that we had when the enthusiasm is high, you know, and the challenges aren't right, right in our face. Um, and so I think that I've learned a lot about myself in, in how to deal with those challenges. And obviously, you know, a, a huge one has been COVID. There's been many on, on uh, many learnings along the way in bringing a product to market. Um, you know, I've, I've learned a lot more about the marketing world than I think I ever thought I would. Um, I've learned a lot more about uh, how to share messages and, and how to, um, reach people and communities and different groups um, using a lot of the tools and social media channels and, and uh, platforms that are available online. Um, and it is constant learnings, right? So it's, um, it has been uh, a journey for us, absolutely, and a journey for me as a leader um, and learning how to balance uh, optimism and excitement um, with, with challenges and reality. I think that's probably uh, something that JS, uh, you've absolutely helped me grow and uh, and become better at. Yeah, if you don't mind me sharing, I mean, Drew is a is a family man, so he's married and has children as well. So he's coping with that as he's building the business. I mean, I'm I'm interested in how COVID uh, has impacted that that fa family dynamic and and but also the startup dynamic and all all of that mixed up. Yeah, so JS is pushing me to become more and more real. So here, here, um, <laughs> here we go. So you know, I sat down with uh, with my wife, and we've uh, we've got three boys here, and we had a very um, honest conversation about what it would like for me to to move from you know, a, I would say a stable and successful uh, career. I was I was also doing venture capital um, at a boutique firm here in Toronto and jump into startup world and uh, and try to build something up with uh, very little security. And so that was a, a very serious conversation that we had. And uh, it's absolutely been met with challenges, right? So um, our 
know, my ability to provide for my family is very different than it was before because um, I'm in a startup with limited resources and we're growing and, and there's different stages of that as we progress. But um, you couple that with some um, very large shifts that affect the economy and certainty and the way that we were experiencing success and actually pulling that back so that we have to find new avenues to achieve success around uh, and reach customers around you know those those are absolutely stressful moments that uh, that continue to kind of chip away again. Um, uh, and and you know you start to kind of question the decisions and the sacrifices that you were okay making before and and, and now but I think it is absolutely just reinforced dealing with COVID, what we're doing and how important that is. And the conversation that I recently had with Jen um, was how important what we're doing is. And so mm -hmm. um, regardless of all the sacrifices personally by myself and team members, and, and you know, um, one of them, Jackie is here on, the, on, the, on the, uh, the call with us today, right? We've all made sacrifices to be a part of this and build it from the ground up. Um, but Jen, you know, has been amazing, has reminded me of why, right? Like we are in the middle of COVID. We are seeing the emergence of chronic disease in patients that are recovering from COVID, um, which is extremely troubling. It, it, it actually, you know, there is a terrible death toll, like over 200,000 people in the U.S. Have, have died from COVID complications or COVID itself. And ultimately that number will grow but the number of people that are gonna be affected health-wise and are gonna develop chronic disease is gonna be much longer, larger than that. A study out of, of Mount Sinai um, showed that of five, uh, early on, about of 5,000 patients that needed to be hospitalized, one third of them had to return to the hospital with kidney damage. So these things are, are very real. And the fact that ACORN is really sitting on technologies that can help provide the ability for us to treat those chronic diseases down the road with the best possible cells from that individual. Um, that ultimately has made our mission in the midst of COVID um, all the more important and all the more clear to us. And so, um, you know, it was, it was just this morning that Jen and I, I were chatting and she said, like, think about all of those patients that ended up recovering from COVID that will probably develop chronic disease earlier in life um you know and think about how many of them that you could potentially provide tissue engineering solutions by them having access to their healthy cells and so um those moments i think is is what keep that that passion mm -hmm. extremely high and, and us up to this challenge great are there any questions from the group i don't see any in the chat no one's if you raising do have a their question, hand. They just oh. jump in. It's not a, sure. not a huge group on the line. So if not, we can, we can wrap, but. We couldn't have possibly yeah. answered every question. So are you, are you fundraising, Drew? Yes. Yes. Well, startups are, are, are always at, at some level. Um, we, we were really um, blessed to have some amazing um, partners with us in our seed round. Um, we are now, um, it, we were actually in the midst of doing a interim round when uh, when COVID broke. And so we were fairly successful at bringing in uh, financing during that. Uh, and then we halted to kind of assess the situation and what was gonna happen with COVID. And we we're gonna continue to raise on those terms and ultimately continue our path and our objective to do a, a series A in 2021. So um, absolutely opportunities now and, and to start conversations towards a series A as well of people uh, depending on their um, investment levels and theses. So very much open to conversations around that if, uh, if people would like to uh, to follow up. Great, so I, I, I just wanna say one thing. Um, I'm, um, so I've, I've been an investor in, in Drew for, well, since the seed round, so what, 18 months, two years? Yeah, yeah, o over. And, uh, yeah. I, uh, Drew, I've, I've really enjoyed working with you and seeing you grow through this process. And I'm, uh, I'm grateful that you're, you're here and that you are trying to build this business and, uh, and help us out, uh, all of, all of us. Um, and, um, like I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to have you in my, in my presence and, uh, if anyone has any other questions, we can go with them. Otherwise we can. Yeah. 
we can stop. We've sort of ran out over time a little bit. No, that's great. I would say there's a there's a healthcare uh, group on our, our Slack channel. So, you know, uh, encourage you all to, you can post there, connect on the channel. If anyone has trouble connecting with any of them, you know, my uh, I'll post my email in the chat. You can certainly happy to help with that. Um, but thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, JS. Thank yeah. you. Thank you to all of you for coming. I found that really, really insightful. And thank you for the honest and candid conversation. So no, thank you so much to everybody that joined and, and JS just to to fire back at you. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure in working with you as an investor, but most of all as a mentor and friend. So thank you so much. My pleasure.